As we move forward in the new, uh, what I want to call, era of ministry at Father's House, you know, a lot of you have been here for, for 10, 12 years now, 11 years, 8 years, 7 years. A lot of you have been with us for a long time. And, you know, we're not going to be changing what we believe. But we're going to begin to refine the vision of the church. And this doesn't mean that we are no longer about grace healing people, okay? But to me, grace healing people, as awesome as it is, is not refined enough. It's, that's a fairly broad topic, and we can kind of branch out, well, this, is this common grace, or is this, you know, this, or is this that? So what I wanted to do in moving forward, and I spent a lot of time praying about it, and I was praying one day, and all of a sudden, the words just popped into my head, Jesus in you, to you, and with you. And there's nothing more healing in grace than revealing Jesus to you, in you, and with you. Okay, or in you, to you, and with you. It's a specific order. <laughs> Um, Grace will always heal people, but what we're doing is we're moving forward now in a new way um, with a a new momentum and in something that I believe the Father would have us do as a body and not as what I want to do moving forward. You know, I'm not going to stand up here and ask you to fulfill my vision. What I'm saying is this is our vision, and you'll see why this is our vision as we get into this today. You know, the call of every believer and, and the, the goal of everyone ought to be to reveal Jesus. Plain and simple. You know, when someone asks you what you're called to, well, I'm called into the ministry of... No, you're called to reveal Jesus. That is it. Anything you add on top of that, anything you... Tra- is why we get into doctrinal debates because we've added on to the simple, pure message of revealing Christ. Um, And and how we're going to adapt that is, like I said, to reveal Jesus in you, to you, and with you. And how how you're hopefully going to adapt that and adopt that is that same process. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, He says, For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Okay, this is the guy who spent, and you've heard me talk about this before, three years alone with Christ in the desert, being extensively ministered to by the one who accomplished it all. He could know a lot of things. But he says, I've resolved not to know anything but Christ and him crucified. So this says that our mission, vision, values, and beliefs must all stem from this one thing, Christ and him crucified. And if you do have a bulletin, that chart in there is something I developed this couple weeks ago. I um, had someone kind of asking me how I take the gospel and how I view the gospel. And so I put that together. And if we could view the, the message of the cross as a diagram, this is what it would look like. We would have... Christ and him crucified as the dirt. And I don't mean that in a negative way. <laughs> dirt is, is absolutely essential for any living thing. And then the seed would be reconciliation, righteousness would be the, true and the, the tree, and the fruit would be everything that we try to pursue. And a lot of times what we can do is we can come at this backwards and we can go after that fruit and we're trying to dig our way down the tree. When all along, if we would just do like Paul said and resolve to know one thing, and that's Christ and him crucified, we would have the soil ready to go. And guess what? That seed's been given. That seed, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing the trespasses against them. So reconciliation has been given to all men. Amen. And if we'll just pursue revealing Christ, then what are we going to reveal? We're going to reveal their reconciliation. And when we reveal their reconciliation, it's going to reveal their righteousness. And when their righteousness is revealed, then all of the things that we chase after are going to come out. Because when, you know, Dad has said it here before, someone who is having a struggle getting healed is someone who doesn't fully understand their righteousness. And that's not a work statement. That's a statement of if we really knew what it was Christ had did, had done, had did, our English would be better. (laughs) If 
we really knew what he did, then that fruit would be effortless. And in some areas of our lives, some of us have kind of gotten there. You know, there, there, are, there are areas with, you know, in our particular home, because I was raised with such a strong healing message, you know, I don't get sick. It's something that doesn't happen. I don't, I don't ever need prayer for sickness because I never get sick. You know, it's much better to not need healing than it is to be healed all the time. And I'm not saying I'm better than you. I'm saying that's a better way to walk in life. And look, I need all other kinds of things. <laughs> I, got, I got one area that things seem to be working right now. <laughs> Now, I, I really believe this diagram is fitting because everything in the gospel, everything in the Bible stems from one of two trees. You have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or what I call the tree of separation. Because at the moment we separate good from evil, it's the tree of separation. And this is the lie that the devil got man to believe. You're separated. Amen. Take that tree, bite it, and realize I'm separated. I'm not like him. Or... You have the tree of life, which is the tree of reconciliation, which is Christ and his cross. His cross is the tree of life, okay? And so what we need to do is we need to ask ourselves, you know, which tree are we eating from? Because God set up everything to produce after its own kind. Everything. So if we're eating of the tree of separation continually, guess what? Guess what kind of fruit we're going to bear? Separation. Separation. And this is, the, this is what we're going to give people. We're going we're gonna to introduce them to the Father through separation. And we talked about this last week. That's, that's a problem. Because that gives birth to all kinds of things. But if we're eating of the tree of reconciliation, we bear the fruit of reconciliation. And the fruit of reconciliation are all those things that are listed there. And I know some of them are written very small. <laughs> Faith, belief, salvation, healing, deliverance, prosperity, prayer, worship. All of those things are fruits of reconciliation. They can only be because reconciliation has made it so. Okay? We need to grasp, and, and again, I've said this before, that we can only be, ever become or be what he has already made us by his grace. Okay, we don't have the power to create ourselves into something else. God made us human. We can never become a dolphin. Okay? Let's just be stupid about it for a minute. We cannot make ourselves something that he hasn't already made us. I can't make myself more human. That's just what I am. Put it another way, our faith only takes hold of what grace has already given. Okay? And what we've done is, and it's a small tweak... But what we've done is we've said, no, what your faith does is your faith makes it real. No. Your faith lays hold of what's already true. Okay, when, when God spoke to Abraham and he said, you shall be the father of many nations, what did he say right after that? Anybody who listens to my dad? <laughs> For I have made you the father of many nations. So you're going to be what I've already made you. And that's the same thing that God says to us today. You're going to be righteous because I've made you righteous. You're going to be healed because I've made you healed. Okay, you're going to be prosperous because I've made you prosperous. You're going to be insert whatever fruit we've been chasing after because I've already made you that thing because you've been reconciled. We can't become alive unless he's already made us alive. Would also be rightly translated as we can only be saved because he saved us. Okay, we can only have faith because he had faith. And then you can carry that all the way out. Now, as we get into this, I fully understand that not everybody is going to agree with me, with, with some of the other people around you, about every point of the vision. And that is fine. I know that might shock some of you. <laughs> it is okay to disagree with what the guy up here says. If more people would disagree with what the man up front says, we probably wouldn't have such crappy theology rampant in the church today. But what we've got right now is we've got Western evangelical Catholicism. Because we rely on the man up front to listen to God and we don't want to study it out for ourselves. And you might, in this church, you know, I know that you guys are good about that. But, 
I mean, last week on Facebook, I had a lady email messaging me privately saying, well, you know, where did you get this, and where did you get this, and where did you get this, and what do you believe about this? And I said, look, here's an online resource. You can go look at the Greek. You don't have to speak Greek. It'll give you the definitions. That'll kind of give you a, a picture of what I believe about this. No, 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 no. I don't want to go study it myself. Please just tell me. You know, it was like a Tuesday. At that point, I'm husband Caleb. I'm not pastor anything. Go study it yourself. If you don't know how to read, I'll help you. But obviously, if you're writing me, you know how to read. So go study it. I don't want to study it. Okay, well then, I can't tell you what I believe, because it doesn't matter what I believe. What matters is the truth. And sometimes, I've found, as I've studied through things, oh, I don't believe the truth on that. And I need to adjust my beliefs. Over the last seven years, this is what's happened to me and why I'm so keen on reconciliation, why I'm so strong on inclusion, are because I threw out everything I believed six or seven years ago and I said, okay, I'm seeing some things here that aren't lining up with the belief system that I'm currently in. What do I do here? Do I say, you know, Pastor so-and-so, can you please explain these away for me so I don't have to deal with them? That's what we usually do. We want it to be explained away. There are troublesome verses for every doctrine. <laughs> and if we explain them away, we do ourselves a, a, a pretty big disservice. Sometimes we need to shelve it and say, look, I don't know. People ask me what I believe about certain topics, and they might seem to be major topics to some people. And I say, I don't know what I believe about that right now. Well, how can you? You have to have an opinion. Why? Where in the Bible does it say, pastors, have an opinion about everything? And try to prove that you're right all the time. <laughs> you know, a good one on that would be the revelation of healing. I don't have a particular revelation of healing like my dad does. Man, the guy can teach it like no other. <laughs> I get up here and try and teach it, and I don't really know. It's always worked for me. There you go. <laughs> Why? Uh huh. We don't have to agree on every point of doctrine to move forward as a family. And see, that's the point, is that we're a family. We're not a church. Okay, this building is not the house of God. It's a building that we collectively rent together. <laughs> because if this many people were to show up at my house, the county would get upset and put me in jail for not having the proper permits. <laughs> so we rent a building. You are the church, okay? You are the body of Christ. You are the temple of God. In the family realm, how many of you disagree with your family from time to time? How many of you, when you disagree with your family, some of you are complete liars. I should have seen every hand up. <laughs> In the realm of family relational stuff, how many of you can, can raise your hand and tell me that every time you disagree, you quit the family? Oh. I'm done. I quit this family. I can't hang out with you anymore. No. <laughs> We're a family. The body of Christ as a whole is a family, and what we've become is a business. To where when the particular CEO at our company doesn't, doesn't line up with our beliefs, we quit. I'm out of here. I'm no longer being a part of this corporation. I'm moving to the one down the street. And we've become church hoppers and, we, and because we don't view each other as family. We view each other at best as co-workers. Most of the time it's complete strangers. This is why unless God does something really miraculous, we'll probably stay in this building forever. I don't care if we have to have 14 services a week. I like that people know each other. Amen. I like that I can look out on a Sunday, and there might be two or three people, I don't know. But I know who you're with, so that means, guess what? Hey, you're part of the family. Have fun. Come on in, get coffee. That's why we have tables and not pews. That's why we don't mind when you spill coffee on the floor. My mom gets a little mad because she's the mom, but some of you might need a sippy cup judging from what's under some of your chairs. <laughs> wow. 
So how can I say that it doesn't matter if we disagree from time to time? Well, I believe that the days are, are rapidly and, and in many areas already have coming to an end. And please understand that, that any of you who know my dad, it isn't this way with him, but where the, the term pastor no longer means the guy who stands up front and asks you to fulfill his vision and then takes all the credit for it. And I think that's coming to an end globally. I think people are done. I think they're realizing, you know, I've been a part of something and I've helped this guy build something. And, you know, in most of these mega ministries and mega churches, that guy would never have time for you. You know, there are ministers locally who have bodyguards and you cannot approach them because there have been threats. Now, if you gave $500,000, you probably could approach them. You could approach me if you gave me $500,000 too. (laughs) But I believe that pastor is once again going to start meaning gatherer, shepherd, and supporter. Because that's what it's all about. And we can go into all kinds of shepherd things. And look, a shepherd is, is anyone who feeds hungry sheep and gathers them and protects them. And so... At the point that I'm operating as a pastor, and and I understand that that those positional ministries that Paul talked about are not titles and they're not identity. Okay, They're positional ministries. It means at some point I might fulfill that position, but at other points I might not. And we could all be very, very well served to remember that in our weekly dealings with each other. Because I might say a word that you don't think I should say as a pastor. And I'll go, well, that's okay. It's because I'm not a pastor. It's Tuesday. I'm a husband. Or it's Friday, I'm a football coach. I might fulfill that role sometimes. Guess what? So might you. I'm not going to walk around calling you, Pastor. Please don't walk around calling me that. Sometimes I might get prophetic in what I sing. Don't call me a prophet. (laughs) Sometimes we might be operating as an evangelist. I've yet to see a business... Well, I'm starting to see them now, but business cards that say evangelist so-and-so. It ain't your title, okay? It ain't your identity. It's a role you fill for a specific time. Now, Paul said some pretty amazing things during his time on earth that really reflect both his humility and his heart. If you go to 1 Corinthians 1 and verses 12 and 13. He says, now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now, in our time, what it would be is, I am of Andrew Womack, or I am of Mike Miller, or I am of Bertie Britz, or I am of Arthur, or I am of Baxter, or I am of Francois, or I am of Paul White, or whoever other minister you want to plug in there. And they become your Bible. I see it all the time. Here's a verse that says this. Yes, but Andrew says, I don't care. Here's a verse that says this. Yeah, but Mike says, I don't care. Here's a verse that says this. Yeah, but you said, then I was wrong. And that's okay. (laughs) I'm not infallible. (laughs) My wife didn't amen that, so maybe I am. Now, rather than touting his own wisdom, his time alone with Christ, his experience, or his knowledge of grace, you know, Paul had all of the ammunition he needed. Oh, yeah? I'm of Apollos. Well, I spent three years alone with Christ, and he didn't. No, he simply says, Is Christ divided? Was Andrew crucified for you? Was Bertie crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Mike? Once again, you see how foolish it sounds when we plug our current experience into it? But this is what we do. Oh, I go to this church. I can't associate with you. And we see, like, we used to try and get citywide worship things going. And, oh, man, you want to see it happen? See it in the worship realm. You start to get together, and all of a sudden the pastors freak out. What, what, you can't have my drummer. He, he needs to stay in my church. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> we just want to get together and worship God and have some fun. It's all right. Look what he says over in Philippians, uh, chapter 1, verse 18. He says, What then? 
only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice and will rejoice. So, what Paul is literally saying here is that whether they're preaching just to get money or preaching the truth of Christ, he rejoices. Now look, I know I'm not there. Because <laughs> there are a few things that make me as mad as people abusing people for their money. It's, it's pretty easy for someone who sits atop a multi-million dollar ministry to tell you that if you're poor, it's that you don't have enough faith. Okay? But, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice and will rejoice. And once again, Paul could have stepped up and said, hey, look, whether in pretense or in truth, I don't care because I'm the one who knows it. And his humility to say, look, same guy that said, for now we know in part, could have said, for now I know everything and you all need to listen to me. (laughs) And so what we have to decide is what is more important, our definition of grace or the revelation of it? Because a lot of times the revelation of grace is going to bypass our definition and smack it around. And this is what's happening in the world today. People are awakening to real grace and it's making mad (laughs) people who are holding on to old dead things. I believe that we can move forward together even with differing views of the gospel if we'll do one simple thing and that's to know Christ and him crucified. And look, I don't, I mean, all the little things are important and we have to learn those things and and debate is okay. I don't mind, you know, people will ask me all the time, how do you let these people on your Facebook page? Look, I don't care that they have a differing opinion from me. That doesn't bother me. Start attacking me and calling me names and I'm going to delete it or call you a name back, but, you know. (laughs) Sometimes I have to like write something and then wait before I hit post. Go back and like, ah, I should probably delete that and that and that and that. And people might call my Christianity into question if I say that. And <laughs> no, it's okay that we disagree on things. It's not, that's not the end of the world. I mean, if we all agreed on everything all the time, life would be boring. But if we resolve to know Christ and him crucified, then what we'll find is that as we move forward together as a family and and working on fulfilling this vision, that we'll find our place. Okay, what does that mean? Does that mean that my place is up in front of you? No. That means that we find our place in this thing that God's got going on. Okay, and, and what part am I going to play in that? You know, some of us are called to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And the ministry is reconciliation. So my job is to equip you to minister reconciliation to everyone around you. But it's also your job to equip me <laughs> to minister reconciliation to all those around me. Okay, this is a big circle. It's meant to be ever exchanging. So what we've done is we've shortened this vision to to make it clear and enable everyone who passes through the doors or meet us face-to-face to to understand it clearly. You know, in the past, we've had those banners hanging up. And I can pretty much guarantee you that I could ask right now, what's the vision of Father's House? And don't turn over your bulletins. And most of you would go, I don't know. But moving forward... If someone were to say, well, what's the church all about? You can just say revealing Jesus. That's the vision. And they're going to go, well, that's pretty simple. And and you're going to go, well, in 2,000 years, we haven't completely done it. (laughs) So it can't be that simple because he's much bigger than we can think. And so as we get into this, please understand that I'm not saying that this is my vision for you. I'm not asking you to come along and help me fulfill my vision in order to grow a huge church. I'd love it if this place was huge. It'd be awesome. But the you I'm referring to here is the you in the mirror as well as the you next door. That means that when you get up in the morning, you say, how can I reveal Jesus to you? And you look in the mirror and you say that to yourself. 
because it's so much more important to reveal Jesus to yourself than it is to reveal yourself to yourself. And so what we've done is we've, we've narrowed this down to three simple points. In you, to you, with you. Galatians 1, 15 to 16, this is out of the New King James. says, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. And what we've done is we've made a, we've made a subtle switch and we've taken evangelism to mean revealing the Son to you. And that's okay. But if it pleased God to reveal the Son in him, then what do you think it would do to your heart to begin to do that as well? It might make you pretty happy. Trust me. I've only been doing this a very, very short time. And in the very, very short time that I've been really focusing on revealing Jesus in people, life has exponentially gotten better. I mean the happiness realm. Okay? Ministry means something now. Instead of trying to convince people of who Jesus was, I'm telling them, he's there. <laughs> Galatians 2.20, this is out of the King James. This is one of the few things the King James got right. I'm sorry. Please don't throw something at me. I didn't mean that. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Pretty much every other translation except for the Young's literal says, by my faith in Christ. And that's absolutely wrong. The literal Greek says, by the faith of the Son of the God. It's a very pointed faith that it's talking about. And we've talked about this before. His faith will come bursting out of those who have the Son revealed in them. When we say that, that Christ as a seed is already there, resting, waiting for you to receive him, what happens? It no longer becomes about bringing him down from heaven. It becomes about releasing what's inside. And his faith comes bursting out. And it becomes something that is an effortless fruit. You know, a lot of times what we try to do is we try to work up enough faith to do something. Well, if I just have enough faith, if I just believe hard enough, if I just believe this or just have, you know, look, why don't you go back to the seed because the fruit is all a result of the seed. And I can never take a piece of fruit and change it into something else through my faith. I've got to change the seed. You see, I, I, I believe <laughs> that belief is no longer a matter of choice when we're presented with the truth. It's compulsory. Okay, what do I mean by that? I mean that, and please hear me and say this right, but... If we are believing in something that we don't know to be true, what are we doing? At best, we're hoping. We're probably more like wishing. We're never told to wish upon Jesus. But when we believe in something because we have experiential knowledge of it, that's belief. Belief is born of knowledge. Okay, I don't believe that Gabby will do something when I ask her to do it because I don't know her and I'm hoping that she will. No, when I call her, I have absolute faith that if I say, hey, can you open the garage door? I'm on my way in. She'll go out and go, yeah. Why? Because I know her. I don't have to get on the phone and, dear Gabby, thank you for this day. I just want to ask that you would open the garage door. <laughs> no, that's where I can have boldness because I have experiential knowledge of my wife. And I think we're rapidly coming in. If we, can, if we can hone in on this vision, I think that we're rapidly coming to the days where faith is no longer a prerequisite to knowing him. It's a byproduct of it. Amen. That as we get to know him, faith will come out. 
And what we've told people is we've started them with separation. We said, you don't know God. You're separate from God. You can't know God. But you can if you'll do this, this, and this. Instead of saying you're not separated from him because he reconciled you to him, you're united with the Godhead, let me teach you about the Father. What did Jesus teach people? He taught them about their Father over and over and over. And he called them your Father to a bunch of people who didn't believe in him. They couldn't yet. He hadn't died. There are 15,000 people at one of his sermons and over 38 times he called God your Father. Why? Because he was trying to end the lie of separation. He was done with it. Okay, that's in you. Let's go to to you. John 14, 9. And we're just going to read one little chunk of this. It says, He who has seen me has seen the Father. So the same one that says, I and my Father are one, says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus' primary goal during his ministry time on earth was not to win souls. And I know that might shock some of you. His primary goal was not to overcome sin. Did he overcome sin? Absolutely. Was that his primary goal? No. And I don't want to go too far into this, but we get into the series on the Godfather. We're going to talk about this. But when Jesus was an immature, on, on the human side of things, an immature like boy, and he's in the temple, and they come to find him, and they're worried, and they say, what were you doing? He says, don't you know it must be about what? My father's business. And then when Jesus matures and begins into his ministry, what does he do? He no longer worries about calling God my father, and he starts to call God your father. Because in maturity, we realize that it's more important that people realize who their father is than proclaiming him as ours and not yours. Now, I don't believe that Jesus was proclaiming God as, as not your father when he was a kid. I don't think he was even thinking about that. Okay, But this is what we do. When we remain immature in our lives and in our walks, we want to tell people, nope, this is my God and not your God. No, he's your God whether you believe in him or not because there's only one. Amen. He's the God of the Muslim and he's the God of the Jew and he's the God of the Buddhist and he's the God of the atheist and they don't believe in him, but he is still their God. Amen. And guess what else that means? He is still their father. And so his primary goal during his ministry time was to reveal the Father to everyone around him. And as our high priest, what did we talk about last week? This is still his desire today. He still wants to reveal the Father's heart to us. He lives to make intercession. And that word means to fall in line with us and go between. Not jump between, go between. (laughs) It's a big difference. So how can we take part in this vision? We can reveal the sun to the you in the mirror, the you next door. Because as we re- reveal the sun to you, guess what happens? He reveals the Father to you. But the problem is, is what we do is we get so caught up in wanting to correct, correctly doctrinalize Jesus that we say, well, this is what he will do. And he will not go beyond these things. And I can't tell you how many people I've talked to. We've got a lady in this church who had a a legitimate experience with God apart from her Bible and the Spirit began talking to her and revealed the Father to her. Just saying over and over again how much God loved her and how apart from anything she could ever do, he accepted her. So here's the Spirit revealing the very heart of the Father apart from the Bible so that now when she goes to the Bible, what happens? She's got the right lens. But a lot of us, what we want to do is we want to say, well, we're going to reveal Jesus to you. Open to Matthew 24. Because that's where Jesus starts to talk about the judgment time. Well, this is how we're going to reveal Jesus to you. We're going to catch him late in his ministry, ministering to Pharisees. And we're going to say, this is about you. No. We can reveal the Son to people simply by saying, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Because of what Christ did, you're reconciled. And look, some people are going to take that and they're going to go, wee, and they're going to go crazy. And that's okay. How many of you have kids that went to college? I don't have kids that went to college. I was a kid who was in college and went absolutely nuts with their freedom. 
I did. I became a severe alcoholic and a drug addict, and I did all. I mean, if there was something wrong that could be done, I've done it. (laughs) And you know what happened? I came back. I enjoyed my freedom. I ruined some people's lives. I nearly ruined my own, but I came back. And the problem in the church today is that what we're doing is we give people a taste of freedom and they bolt out the door and then we go chase them. And you know what our response is if someone's chasing us? Run! (laughs) It's like when our puppy goes outside. She goes, take him off! And and if I go chase her, guess what? She's gone. But if I stop and I go, tink, she boop, and she sits down and she waits. And then I can approach her. It's okay to let people have their freedom. Some of them are going to come back and support what we're doing, and that's awesome. And other ones are not, and that's fine too, because they're still a part of the family, and they still deserve our unwavering love and support. And that's hard. You know, it's hard to be in a quote-unquote leadership position in a church and have everyone who is your friend at the time that they leave the church immediately stop being your friend. Oh, can't communicate with you anymore. Don't go to your church. And I'm talking immediately. The Sunday they quit the church is the Monday they stop talking to me. That's hard. But you know what? If I go chase, (laughs) it's going to create running. And I'm not going to do that. I heard one guy say one time, I'm a shepherd, not a sheepdog. And a shepherd calls the sheep in and a sheepdog goes and rounds him up. (laughs) And the message we're proclaiming here and the message you're going to hear from myself and my dad and from Arthur, from Baxter and from Jeff Turner and from Francois Dutoy and from Andre Robb and from Steve McVeigh is a message of reconciliation. And that message beckons people in. It might scare the religious, but it beckons the world. People want to know that God accepts them as they are. Knowing the Father is the key to life and the key to all we desire, and to accurately know the Father, there is only one person who can reveal that to you. Mike Miller. No, Jesus Christ. That's how we treat it. I know that's funny in here, but you know what? You get out there and you make, make a comment sometime. Those of you here on Facebook, make a comment about someone's favorite teacher. Hey, I heard so-and-so say this, and I think they might be wrong. And watch what happens. Facebook will email you and say, you have too many comments on this post. Please take it down. You know, Jesus did something really amazing, and this isn't in my notes, but in the the story of the woman at the well, and I know I've talked about this before, but it bears repeating. He comes to this woman whose society views as the lowest of the lowest of the low. You know, not only is she a Samaritan, but she's also a prostitute. No, not even a prostitute. She's also a woman who gives it away for free. So she's below a prostitute because at least they got paid for what they did. And, I mean, this woman is down there on, on the rung. And she's been with five men. The one she's with now is not her own. And after a few minutes with Jesus, she runs back into town to all the people that make fun of her and say, I've met another man. (laughs) Now, you had to know what kind of healing went on inside this woman to not feel shame in running back into town and saying that. So if people aren't healed today, if people aren't walking the way that we think they ought to be walking, then chances are we probably haven't accurately revealed the sun to you. Because when we accurately reveal the sun to you, a change happens. And I'm not talking about a change of action. The Bible doesn't record that she married that man. I don't think God is concerned with our actions at all. He wants us to stop hurting ourselves. Jesus didn't tell her, go marry this guy or get away from him, go back to your first husband, which is what most of the church would do. You're living in adultery if you're married. Well, I've been married three times. Third time's a charm. This one's going to stick. I'll be transparent with you. It's okay. (laughs) 
Something took place inside this woman because the son revealed to her something. And we can doctrinalize it all we want. We can debate it. But at the end of the day, if I'm not seeing in me what I think I should be seeing in me, then I haven't properly revealed the son to me. Let's go on to with you. Hebrews 13.5 For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you unless you deny me or don't believe in me. Every bit as important as in you and to you is with you. What good does it know, what good does it do us to know that we have someone in us or that we like have this guy that we've been taught about if we don't know that he's actually with us? And I'm not talking about with you when you're in church but not when you're mad. I'm talking about sitting at the bar with you drinking too much. I'm talking about sitting in the strip club with you. I'm talking about, you know, in whatever activity that you're doing in life that you think is vile and disgusting, Christ is right there with you. And that is not a message of guilt. Don't, don't get yourself in a position where you feel guilty for the things you do because Jesus is watching you. He's not watching you. He's with you. Big difference. At best, what that does, if, if we don't know that he's with us, is that makes us have an unapproachable person as a father or in the person of Christ. He's famous. He's got bodyguards because he's a big-name minister. I know him. He's been revealed to me. He's got long hair and a beard and a flowy white gown. At worst, it makes them our enemy if we don't know that they're with us. Yeah, Jesus has been revealed to me, but he's against me because of this action in my life. You know, and I can't go without saying this almost every other Sunday, but I, 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 I had a real hard time when I was at a particular minister's conference and I see this big name minister pounding the pulpit about the abomination of homosexuality and talking about how sinners aren't comfortable or sinners need not feel comfortable in our churches. And my reply was fairly loudly, if they don't, it's because Jesus isn't there as I walked out. Because not only did Jesus receive sinners, he made them feel comfortable in his presence. Okay, it wasn't about loving the sinner but hating the sin. He loved the human apart from their sin. And he didn't concern himself with it because he knew he was about to remove it. God's desire is for us to know as we are known, to know him as we are known. The only way to reach this is to reveal him with us at every turn of life. Okay, so the better part of fulfilling this vision would be to take on all three roles as our personal vision and fulfill the gospel. Okay, at least to me. That's my opinion. Okay, that if I can reveal the Son in you, to you, and with you at all times, awesome. But you know what? If you don't agree with a certain part of this, and, and the one that more people have a problem with than, than any other is the in you, that's fine. Don't agree with that. Reveal Jesus to people. That's better than not doing anything. <laughs> And I don't mind that you don't agree with that. That's fine. That's how I see the gospel. Okay? That's okay. You don't have to 100% believe like I do to come to this church. If that were the case, there wouldn't be anybody here. Trust me. <laughs> There's some things you'll never hear me teach on because my beliefs are a little out there. And that's all right. Because I don't believe like you and you don't believe like me. Guess what? Jesus is still the Son of God. He still died for us. He still rose again. He's still the only way to the Father. If you're going to take on revealing Jesus to people, just make sure it's the Jesus of the Gospels, the one who healed everyone who asked, the one who loved fiercely, the one who defended the feeble and welcomed sinners. Make sure that's the Jesus that we're revealing to people. The one who loves all unconditionally. Maybe you can't do the in you or the to you thing, but the with you makes sense. 
Just make sure that you're revealing the Son as he is today, risen, holy, human, and divine who lives to help us. Okay, that's the with you. That's the one who is with you, the one who lives to make intercession. The one who, that's what gives him the greatest joy. Okay, so the point of all this is this. We can all work together to take the gospel into the world, and that's our vision. Okay, the, re- the vision is to reveal the Son, period. <laughs> everything we do is about this, and everything that, that we take on, and every missions event that we're going to be doing, and every, everything we do is in an effort to reveal Jesus. Sometimes it's all going to be in you. Sometimes it's going to be in you, to you, and with you. Sometimes it's all going to be with you. Sometimes it's all going to be to you, and that's cool. Okay, take whatever gets you going and run with that. Now, I had someone ask me, and so I want to touch on it quickly, and then we're going to be done, and it's only 11.20. You all owe me lunch. No, I'm just kidding. I had someone ask me, why didn't we use the phrase, as you? In you, to you, with you, and as you. And I very specifically didn't use as you. Okay, while I agree that Jesus did die as all, one died for all, therefore all died, okay? Traditionally and historically, whenever as begins to enter the equation, something happens. And that something is that you lose your individual identity. And I don't believe that that's the Father's heart. Okay, I don't believe women that God wants you to view yourself as the Son, Okay, just as holy, just as righteous, just as blameless and above reproach, yes. But God doesn't want you viewing yourself as a man. <laughs> okay, you are not a man. You are a woman. And that is a very good thing, especially if you're a man. But the thing that happens when we lose our individual identity is we start to think about all of our actions must be, and this is historically, all of our actions must therefore be the actions of Christ. Okay, that can be a good thing. But what has happened historically is there's a thing called antinomianism that has happened where this is a group that has rejected the law saying Jesus fulfilled all the law, it's done away with, the moral code is done away with. That's right. And now we are as him. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Because what happened in this group and what's happened a few times over history is that therefore leads to, and I don't know why because I don't think this way, but God ordains all of my actions meaning I can do whatever I want. And the group that, that did this the first time began to slaughter people and they began to rape people and they began to, I mean, they did all kinds of vile, disgusting things because God's ordained everything we've done because I am his Christ. So anything I want to do must be his desire through me. And you see how twisted it can get? So I will always say, yes, Jesus died as you. Okay? And that's not to say he took your place because if you were deserving of death, the father would have killed you. Okay, mankind would not be on this planet if man deserved death. I'm saying he died as you, meaning one was lifted up, all were lifted up. One was dead, buried, resurrected. All were dead, buried, and resurrected. Okay? So in that realm, yeah, as is appropriate, but we're not going to take that as a part of our vision because I don't want to see anyone... (laughs) beginning to take that approach. I don't want to see any of the female side of the family losing their individual identity. Okay, you are not all sons of God, you are sons and daughters. And if we can just throw a little dig in religion for a second, we are not the bride of Christ. He is my father, not my father-in-law. You see, that works both ways. Women, you're not the son. Men, you're not the bride. We can all rejoice. So as we go on forward, I want you to keep one thing in mind, and that's the number one, two things, sorry. Number one, that the Father doesn't love you in spite of you. He loves you because you're you. And because you're you, you're going to have a specific point that really gets you going. To me, it's revealing the sun in you. That, I love it. I see it in the word. I like talking about it to people. My wife tells me to shut up all week long. Stop talking about it. Let's talk about something else. (laughs) 
And then keep in mind that we don't always have to agree on every point of doctrine as long as we can agree that the focus, purpose, and point of it all is Christ and him crucified. Amen?